So I'm bisexual. So I think YouTubers doing coming out videos seems to be its own fucking genre, doesn't it? Folk putting so much of themselves and their personalities through their videos. And I guess I'm following that trend here as well because this is a John the Duncan coming out video and as such we're going to use it to talk about white supremacy, pink washing and how it feels to have your new tentative subject who had exploited in the service of active colonial genocide. Dumb. Oh, this video is going to get demonetized so fucking fast. So last year I went to my first Pride as a mostly out bisexual. And it was a big day. As, and as was the story with so many people, I had been taking tentative steps out for months, maybe maybe years beforehand, sort of renegotiating my sense of self and reframing my life. You know, apparently, straight people don't think that when they see a man they think is cool, that means that's what women feel when they think a man is hot. Apparently, straight people don't just look at men and think they're, they're kind of hot. Uh, who knew? And apparently straight kids don't think that they're on the edge of straight and gay and they think like it's a speck, like a, like a line and if they have a child then that child will then be gay because they're down the line so if they have a child then they must, you know, that's how that works. <laughs> for, for, for much of my life I didn't have the tools to understand what being bisexual meant. But now I did. For so long though as I started this process of sort of becoming myself. I was doing so largely alone or with a few people close to me. It wasn't this big public thing but a little thing that seemed fragile and sometimes unreal but coming to Pride felt like finally taking this fragile little thing and making it big. It was, you know, exciting. I'd also felt kind of unmoored for a while and unsure of myself and maybe stepping out into pride could be a time to feel a connection to a new community that I'd found myself thrust into. And it was largely a great day. It was a largely fantastic day. I was with some people who were really close to me, my very supportive, also bisexual girlfriend and some good friends. And I got really, really drunk. But I'm afraid I was very... Very drunk. <laughs> and came out to a great many people, as I knew would happen. Um, but while we were at the main London Pride event, and I was fine with the cues, I could cope with the corporatism, I had a water bottle filled with gin. But suddenly, after some music and some marriage proposals, and generally good vibes, it was announced to, to raucous cheers that Israeli Eurovision star and supposed queer icon Netta was to take the stage. And, and in this mass of cheers, this new and exciting part of me slammed headfirst into the complex and sometimes ugly reality of queer instrumentalization and white supremacy. It fucking sucked. In 2010, the Israeli news site Unet reported that Tel Aviv Tourism Board had begun a campaign of around 90 million US dollars to brand the city as an international gay vacation destination. The promotion, which received the support from the tourism ministry, and Israel's overseas consulates includes depictions of young same-sex couples and financing for pro-Israeli movie screenings at lesbian and gay film festivals in the United States. The government isn't alone. An Israeli pornography producer even shot a film, Men of Israel, on the site of a former Palestinian village. So my YouTube and TikTok have been 
inundated recently with adverts encouraging me to visit Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And these adverts present two young, attractive, queer-coded Israelis dancing and promoting Tel Aviv. And Jerusalem is like these great venues for tourism, you know, which includes the nightlife. Hey, yo! We want to introduce you to the most amazing destinations in the world. Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And this is undoubtedly part of a concerted strategy from Israel and Tel Aviv to present this horrendous colonial endeavour as somehow an oasis of queer safety amongst an evil Muslim world. This is a process known as pinkwashing. Pinkwashing is when a state leverages a supposed positive reputation for protecting LGBT rights as a means of obscuring its national crimes and imperialist endeavours. It's been applied to many, many states across the world, but most notably to the US and Israel. And in fact, for Israel, it's become a central strategy for presenting itself as a modern, democratic nation amongst a sea of evil Muslim states. You know, a beacon of freedom. Beginning with Israel's hosting of World Pride in 2006 and continuing explicitly through its hosting of the Eurovision Song Contest in 2019, it's a branding exercise used to justify and maintain the ongoing brutal settler colonial project. It's part of a project literally called Brand Israel. And you know, the problems with the notion that Israel is an oasis of queer liberation within a sea of backwards Muslim nations are vast and numerous. I mean, firstly, and most obviously, the intense securitized control that Israel enforces over all Palestinians across all the land Israel currently occupies and over all those in Gaza and the West Bank is immense. Drawing on the work of Akhil Mbembe, many have characterised Israel's control over Palestinian populations as necropolitical. Palestinians are controlled by keeping them constantly on the edge of death, and this manifests most clearly in the systems of checkpoints across occupied Palestine. As part of a gradual process that began at the conclusion of the Six Day War in 1967, the state developed a labyrinth system of checkpoints that has given it almost complete control over the mobility of Palestinian bodies, including the ability to impose both external closures on the West Bank and Gaza that seal them off from Israel and the rest of the world, and internal closures and curfews that further limit the mobility of Palestinians to specific cities, villages, and other defined areas. In 2005, Israel unilaterally withdrew from the Gaza Strip, limiting the exercise of its sovereignty there to occasionally limit military incursion, naval blockade, or aerial bombing campaigns. The checkpoint system, as Wiseman demonstrates, has assumed an overall strategic layout constituting a complete territorial system whose main aim is to dominate and manage the lives of Palestinians. Throughout Israel-Palestine, whatever their legal status and regardless of the frequency with which they actually encounter a literal checkpoint. So this need for ever more oppressive control over Palestinians is born of the requirement within Zionism to view Palestine as an empty land, ready to be colonised, a, a desert ready to be made to bloom. And the presence of indigenous Palestinians is a problem to be solved, and thus, the same with every settler colonial project, Zionism turns genocidal. The Palestinian author of Orientalism, Edward Said, described this clearly. Said writes that, for much of its modern history, Palestine and its native people have been subject to denials of a very rigorous sort. Because the Zionist project requires what it called a land without a people for a people without a land, the Zionists convinced themselves that these natives did not exist, then made it possible for them only to exist in the most rarefied forms. First denial, then blocking, shrinking, silencing, hemming in. First denial, then blocking, shrinking, silencing, hemming in. The checkpoints which define Palestinian life are the direct result of the genocidal settler colonial drive to control the indigenous Palestinian population. With this knowledge, the notion that Israel can claim to be a place of justice because of a self-professed pride in its gay rights record is not only absurd, but obscene. But it's not just that 
Israel's pride in gay rights is undermined by this separate injustice of settler colonialism, but that its settler colonialism defines its oppression of queer Palestinians. While queer Israeli space is popularly represented as an idyllic oasis of tolerance and diversity, as queer Palestinians traverse that space, they encounter a never-ending set of roadblocks and obstacles. Checkpoints, where queer Israelis inspect and regulate the flow of queer Palestinian bodies. At times, the same techniques that soldiers employ at the literal checkpoint are available. In bars, for example, queer Palestinians are frequently denied entry when their paper reveals their Palestinianness. Queer Palestinian life is defined by Israeli control. The dissonance between the image presented of a tolerant Israel, where even the soldiers are held up as exemplars of a happy, out gaze, crashes into the brutal reality of control over queer life to such an extent that queer Palestinians now joke of a non-existent pink gate which magically appears when gay Palestinians approach the barrier ready to be saved from Palestine by the benevolent Israel. And the reality is that homophobia is often instrumentalised in these checkpoints, through these checkpoints, with stories of Israeli soldiers forcing queer Palestinians to out themselves in front of their families, which is something which every queer person knows is fucking dangerous. But for this regime of checkpoints, this is just another method of control. And within Israel as well, queer Palestinians are constantly at risk of super exploitation in the labour market, surveillance and deportation back across the checkpoints. And the fact is that, despite homosexuality being legalised in the West Bank since the 50s, life for queer Palestinians in Palestine, just like for queer people everywhere, can be intensely dangerous due to widespread trans and homophobia. But the way this is used by Israel with things like a threat of deportation, and the only way it can be used for a society which is built on control and exterminations, is to exert further control over Palestinians, whether that is by utilising Israel's pinkwashing strategy to alienate queer Palestinians even further from the struggle they share with other Palestinians. It attempts to draw them away from their families and their friends and into the orbit of self-proclaimed LGBT paradise Tel Aviv. The politically neutered discourse and lifestyle of gay identity and rights in Israeli Jewish context offers an exciting insight that Israel is desperately afraid of Palestinians organising around the intersecting issues of occupation, apartheid and sexual and gender based oppression. Or by presenting an image of Palestine and the Muslim world in general as innately backward and evil compared to the enlightened project of Israel. And this is a thread that we will be returning to later on. Pinkwashing is both a project of internal control of Palestinians and external image management to justify Israel's brutal regime to the rest of the world. For Israel to present itself as a location of queer liberation is, by definition, to erase the oppression and even existence of queer Palestinians. But it also needs to be noted that while even if it were true that Israel were a paragon of gay liberation for Israelis, which wouldn't justify the ongoing colonial oppression, the picture painted of a tolerant Israel is far from the truth, even for queer Israelis. Homophobia is of course rampant in Israeli society too, despite the propaganda, and this homophobia is even worse for anti-occupation queer Israelis, who find themselves rejected by friends and families for both being queer and for fighting against occupation. Pinkwashing obscures this and thereby maintains the homophobia within Israel too. And fundamentally though, pinkwashing is a tactic to further the genocidal settler colonial control over Palestinians. It isn't just a nuisance or a bit cringe as I you know, see some people describe it. It's fucking horrendous. So there I was standing in London Pride filled with gin <laughs> excited and let myself go when suddenly to rapturous fucking cheers I was confronted with all of this fucking hell. Netta <laughs> smiling and dancing as a cultural ambassador for this genocidal state. A person 
so committed to destroying Palestinians that she volunteered with the Israeli paramilitary before joining the IDF, who loudly and pointedly declared next year in Jerusalem when she won Eurovision. Israel is amazing. We, we are amazing people. We are very warm and vibrant and we have good values. Even in death, no peace for Shireen Abu Akleh. Israeli police beating Palestinian mourners with nightsticks as they try to carry her coffin through the streets of Jerusalem. We have such bad PR in the world. They try to control our lives and they try to control our death and our mourning. That's what it means to live under Israeli military rule. It's the spirit of, you know, feminism that comes and takes what it deserves with a smile and with a hug. The Abu Rajab family is slowly but surely being forced from the cluster of apartment buildings which are their ancestral family home. Israeli settlers arrived on July 25th, broke into three of the apartments and moved in. Within hours, the army turned the site into a closed military zone, in effect providing protection to the settlers and restricting the Abu Rajab's access to their own home. Feminism that comes and takes what it deserves with a smile and with a hug. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yami. You know, this is what I love about gay parades. And almost everyone around me was just clamoring towards it, like lapping it up. It was like slamming into a brick wall every good feeling about that day evaporated and looking around at this sea of white queers of which I was now part, I no longer felt any sense of pride, um, but I felt nothing but shame, you know, which seems fucking counterproductive for pride, doesn't it? <laughs> It's weird though, but because it's not as if I didn't know on an intellectual level that London Pride was a deeply compromised and fucking corporate space. I've known that for years. I hadn't forgotten. The, the plan for the day was just to sort of fucking pop by before meeting up with friends because we knew how, how compromised a space it was. But still, with this shielding up, there was something wounding, I don't know, wounding about about this experience of having a new sense of myself which had previously been kept only for me and in that sense it was safe and to now be so enthusiastically instrumentalised to perpetuate horror uh, I felt like I'd been corrupted and I just stood amongst the dancing frozen in my spot Wishing I was literally anywhere else. And I think the, what, what really got me wasn't just that Netta was there. You know, Pride had engaged in Israeli pink washing before. But it was that no one around my, like, outside of my group seemed to fucking care. Like I knew previous years that there had been protests and walkouts as London Pride tried to do its pink washing, but this year, my first proper moment of connection with a new community, that community shamed itself and made me ashamed to be there. They did nothing but cheer and dance, and it became clear just in that moment just how deeply fucking embedded white supremacy is within that space. Another thing I knew on an intellectual level but which was very different to feel. So, people watching this, you watching this, might think, ah, what's the big deal, man? Like, it's just a Eurovision star. Now it's just a Eurovision star. It's like, she's just a person. She's not the Israeli state. Why does it matter? Uh, unfortunately, for such equivocations, the story and power of Eurovision as a method of pinkwashing, exerting state soft power and projecting a shared Europeanness is a well-examined one. And it's actually essential 
for understanding what Israel actually is, to understand how it's a project of European colonialism, which constantly seeks to align itself with a mythology of European values, a mythology which includes a supposed tolerance of LGBT people, which is a sick joke when we look at Britain's murderous transphobia. And of course, the other side of this tolerance is the creation of a demonised Muslim other defined by its intolerance of gay people, of women as well, is, an, is another common one that this other is constructed against. It's the spirit of, you know, feminism with the celebration. So let's talk about Eurovision and pink washing. Eurovision was established in 1956 with the explicit goal to create and broadcast a coherent common European identity. Since its creation, it's become a route through which states have not only laid claim to a European identity, which is not bound by geographical boundaries, and you know, it's not just Israel, but other settler colonial genocidal regimes like Australia, which have become included in Eurovision. You know, people are entitled to their sexual proclivities. You know, I mean, let there be a thousand blossoms bloom as far as I'm concerned. You know, but I ain't spending any time on it because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. But it's also become a way that European identity is performed and reinforced, not just by those external, geographically external European Eurovision countries, but uh, the internal uh, European countries as well. Eurovision? Eurovision? Eurovision as an event has contributed to not only creating a particular dimension of European identity, but it has also served as the route through which states have performed this identity. The legitimization of European belonging that the contest allows has for long been utilized to associate states with European values, regardless of geography or little else apart from European identification. Through an association of Europe with a particular branch of modernity, Eurovision has represented European belonging since its conception and participation in the contest is more hard fought for than ever. This European identity is far from innocent. It is innately tied to capitalism, to white supremacy and to violent border regimes. Europe presents itself as a peaceful, sexually liberated, modern place, a beacon of freedom. A place which wants to be protected from uncivilised people, notably Muslims who in the white supremacist European mythology are uniquely and especially dangerous to women and LGBT people. And this logic has justified imperial wars, violent bordering through fortress Europe, and the over-policing and surveillance of Muslims in schools and universities through things like Britain's Prevent programme. So this sort of projection of European identity directly harms minority groups within Europe as well as projects imperial wars outside of Europe. And as a note, this particular form of European racism, which focuses on the innately terrible culture of the uncivilised groups like Muslims, is a form of neo-racism, which is essential to the construction of a Hayekian neoliberalism which viewed Anglo-Saxon culture as like being uniquely civilised enough to pr produce the free market society. I said that this video would reflect myself, so here's my neoliberalism of the day. <laughs> oh, we have fun here, don't we? We have fun here. European institutions have consciously constructed LGBT inclusivity as part of European identity, both through its inclusion, reference and protection. This works perfectly to adhere such values to a European identity because it inherently classifies external actors as non-inclusive. By projecting ideas of exclusion and homophobia onto non-European cultures, particularly Muslims, it inherently creates an essentialistic binary that reduces complex issues to a simple national in or out. So being in with Europe automatically means that those they might be in conflict with are out. And for decades, Eurovision has been constructed as a massive gay event.
and as such, as a mode of projecting European identity, it serves to project the European mythology of a tolerant, progressive Europe. And Israel's position in Europe reveals this dynamic so clearly, while also reinforcing it. It is built on excluding, othering, and destroying Muslims. And in doing so, Israel constructs itself as consistent with the European mythology of supporting sexual liberation. And Israel is an in-group with European identity, while Palestine is an out-group. This is both a reflection of Israel's fundamental construction of a set European settler colonial project and an outcome of some real politic manoeuvring by successive Israeli governments. By positioning itself as part of Europe, it gains inherent value to, to Europe. While framing Palestinians as oppositional to those values, it cements its colonial victims as inherently threatening to European modernity. And because Palestine is constructed as being innately Muslim, this further reinforces the idea that Muslims as such are a threat to European values. The, uh, the pinkwashing of Eurovision and Israel's participation in it promotes the Islamophobia which gets projected all the way through Europe and, importantly, through queer spaces like London Pride 2. It reinforces white supremacy. And part of the feeling I had watching people cheer on Netta was a reaction to how clearly London Pride was constructed as a white supremacist space where especially queer Muslims were not necessarily safe. Queer Muslims are often viewed patronizingly as in need of saving from their own community, part of which means assimilating into a white supremacist uh, homonormative standard. We can call this a homonormative assimilationist drive, whereby a class of white, middle-class gays push gay liberation as getting you know, gay people, LGBT people accepted as normal, which is, of course, tied to white supremacist ideals, rather than fighting for any abolition of any sense of normality, which necessarily requires the overturning of white supremacy. And these two tweets, one from my friend Kaylin, sums up this criticism well. And this assimilationist drive is also the same which produces gay transphobes, that produces the absurd declarations to get rid of kink at pride, you know, why can't we just be normal so people take us seriously, and produces racist Islamophobic environments. Queer Muslims are pressured to abandon their communities and their faiths to fit in to this white supremacist homonormative norm because their very Muslimness is constructed as inherently threatening to queerness. This creates a dynamic whereby, rather than the queer community offering a space of solidarity and safety, it just becomes another stick to beat queer Muslims with, making their lives less and less safe. They're excluded from queer spaces because of white supremacy. The result is spatial politics, in which marginalised groups are not completely expelled from the city or nation, but remain excluded and contained through their failure to achieve the consumer citizen status. This failure, in turn, is linked back to the discourse of a cultural deficit of Muslim communities. The link becomes especially relevant in the neoliberal city where white, middle-class, may, gay consumer citizens represent the successful integration of minorities into the mainstream. And there's a clear connection, I think, between this this dynamic and the ways in which queer Israelis treat queer Palestinians, you know, demanding a separation between themselves and their families, or even their very Palestinianness. One story from Richie's article told of an uh, Israeli boyfriend of a Palestinian outright asking him to no longer be Muslim, to no longer be Palestinian. And when the boyfriend refused, the relationship fell apart. And, and like this, the exclusion and control over queer Palestinians and or the exclusion and control of queer Muslims in Britain serves a particular construction of European identity reinforced via the pinkwashing of events like Eurovision, consistent with sides Orientalism, Muslims and Palestinians are constructed as both aggressors and victims, requiring saving by European assimilationist 
white supremacist powers. So I can imagine, well, I don't have to imagine, I got these responses at the time when I tweeted about it, so I know people will respond to this video with, like, you know, it's just Eurovision, or it's just a pop singer. It's not that deep. But it, it wasn't just Eurovision. It was a microcosm of Orientalism, of white supremacy, and of the reconstitution of a anti-Muslim European identity for both Israeli colonial occupation and fucking racist Britain. And I was expected to cheer it on. I felt like a fucking weirdo for not doing so. A weirdo for not cheering. Just enjoy yourself. This isn't a place for politics, it's pride. I don't really know what a satisfactory conclusion to this is. The rest of the day was really great fun and I had amazing people to talk to and to talk through all of this with at the time. And my girlfriend had confronted similar feelings before. But when I think of this, my first out pride, it's the feelings of fury and shame that loomed the largest that night. And that night, when I lay in bed and started processing everything, I had the most fucking guttural weep of my entire adult life. The sort of cry that, you know, can't be stopped. I fucking cry. I, I, I cry at fucking animated cartoons. Heading in two is incredible. They fucking told you. This is a different sort of, sort of thing, just sort of leaps out of you and kind of just sort of splutters out of you. It just, you know, it couldn't be stopped. And some of it was rage that had been used to further the genocidal goals of an apartheid state. Some of it was fury at the people who happily offered themselves up to be used. And some of it was fucking shame and embarrassment that I even felt any of that, that I'd been tricked into thinking I could experience some wholeness at a corporate pride event that's willfully forgotten what it's supposed to be fighting. And regardless, ever since then, my bisexuality has never felt the same. It feels more complex and almost corrupted, which I guess is silly, but it's just the effect that that pride had on me. And at the end of the day, the real message to take from this video is, you know, fuck Israel, fuck the British state, fuck Europe, and racism that excludes, controls, murders, and exploits Muslims, both queer and straight, across this continent and its offshoots. If there's anything that needs doing within the queer community, if such a thing even fucking exists, it's taking back control of pride from the homonormative white supremacists and making sure our spaces are as open as possible for oppressed queers across society. Love and solidarity. I'm done. Alright, hello. So, for obvious reasons, this is quite a big video for me. And for obvious reasons, it's almost certainly going to be demonetized. So if anyone wants to sign up to Patreon or uh, or pa push a ko or a PayPal my way, all that stuff is in the link in the video description. Uh, and if, if not, it's a tough time for all, I would appreciate any likes and shares on the video and all that. Um, let's, let's see, let's see what the reaction to this is. I'm unsure. Um, so, ten, $10 not patrons do get their names read out in the credits, so, so I'll just do that um, right now. And just because I read your name out doesn't mean I love them any more than all the other patrons, so don't get jealous. Alright, so, we've got Demons, oh sorry, Demo Squid, Dying of Thirst, Philip McEachan, FD Signifier, Lizzie G, Quint Wolf, Kim Crawley, Anita Anispe, Ellis Wren, Sophie, Hey Joe, Cameron and Blakemore, Quink, Morgusse, Daniel Cusid, uh, Joshua Moldenhauer, Tom Price, Cade Zwari, uh, Esoteric Fictionalism, Shingo, Austin Talman, Robin, Rachel Mixon, Rich, Neil Zabaldgard, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Aga Ghost, Barney Carroll, Joe, Daniel Hughes, Jay Fraser Cartwright, Aaron, 
Tamash Kispeto and Paul Singleton. Uh, and like I said, uh, like and share, and we'll see what we're, we're, where we go next time. Uh, cheers. Yeah.